Hello, I am Giuliano. I am going to present uh, how we use the LLVM infrastructure, mainly Clang, to extract code from projects to create live patches. Uh, my name is Giuliano. I am the user space live patching developer. Uh, he is Marcos. He is working on the kernel live patching team. And here is the overview of uh, the presentation. So I will speak about what the problem is, what the existing tools we have, and what we need for user space live patching. Uh, some details about, about some experiments we did on Clang infrastructure. Uh, then I will do my best to do some introduction to the Clang's uh, abstract syntax tree, because uh, we use that. So how we can dump uh, things, how, uh, how the declarations uh, interact with each other, how we can use Clang as a library and with some examples. Then I will uh, speak about the project itself, so uh, the command line interface, how we ac actually print the declarations, uh, how we do stuff with macros, how we do the transform code, and how we chain everything together in such a way that we can manage things. And finally, uh, we'll speak about some bugs we found on Clang. So, okay, so let me define the problem. So in live patching, basically we have a set of functions and they often have some bug that we want to fix. And then we replace those functions with another set of functions that have their bugs fix it, so what we usually do, but not always the case, uh, we apply the original patch to the project, then we extract the functions, the fixed version of the functions, to a separate project, uh, together with their dependencies, then we check for code pitfalls, like ensure that it's actually live patchable, or, um, and the, 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 like, the program doesn't uh, require like a clean state, uh, then we build the live patch and test it. But what we are going to talk today is this step here, so extracting the code, uh, which is, uh, can be really, really, uh, um, it, it, it can be very, very uh, troublesome. So let's say we want to extract a single function. What we want to do, oh, so there is a, 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 some code example on the right. So let's say we want to extract F, which is uh, in red here. And what we want to do is add everything we need to the output and remove everything we don't need to the output. Then we do uh, some code transformation so we can um, uh, take advantage of some code layout that is on the target application. The thing is that due to the halting problem, we cannot decide if a bug is live patchable, so we do what we can, so probably there is no way we can like automate everything, but we can automate a lot of things. So I will now speak about uh, existing tools. So the kernel team has a, a tool named call PCCP, C, copy, and paste, which is a code extractor that works on the kernel, but it is C only, and we ha it has an, an in-house parser. And they also have another tool that is able to analyze GCC dumps to know which transformations GCC did on the code. But for user space live patching, we want broader language support, so because we have customers uh, interested in having C++, and creating live patches for their own products. So we need to provide them tools uh, for them as well. So the question is, can we reuse the existing compiler infrastructure? So I watched this presentation here from 2014, and it explains how to use like the basics uh, of the AST to actually debugging things. And one thing that uh, caught my attention was that it, can, it could dump the ST in a sort of compilable format. And as a consequence of that, I could get a free C or C++ parser and a code, a code transformation engine. 
Uh, so if I could wire things up to actually extract code from that, that would be awesome. Okay, so I will try my best to actually uh, uh, try to present how the ST works on Clang. Okay, so we have these two comments here, and I will show what they do. The first thing he want, can you see the terminal? Okay. Oh, great. Okay. Okay, so, so this is some sample code. I try to do thing, uh, keep things uh, very uh, concise, so I don't like include headers and such. But um, if we run like Clang, uh, okay. So uh, if we run the ST dump of things you can see that there is like a description of uh, the ST nodes. For example, uh, here we have the main function that is actually here, and you can see it's a function decal. And the interesting thing about this is that, uh, Chrome. if I go to clang, function decal, And then I can have a, 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 a very uh, interesting documentation about what those things can do and what it can't, which is very interesting if you like you are, uh, it's our first time uh, doing stuff with Clang. And uh, it's very nice. So that's the dump of the the. the uh, nodes, but we can also have a dump, uh, a, a, a printing of the ST on a compilable format. Uh, so, okay, so here, let me do this. So, as you can see, the it actually this is actually a dump of the AST itself. So there is no like macro. So as you can see here, it actually uh, returns the uh, macro which defined to zero, but here it expanded to zero, uh, and the unit macro was removed because it's an ST dump. It's it doesn't contain any uh, preprocessing information. So yeah, uh, if we want to print code, then we'll have to. Uh, we could use this as a way to fall back if things get really really complicated. So uh, all right. And if you go to the Clang documentation, uh, they have like this kind of uh, class hierarchy for declarations, which you can look and find things there. Statements as well, but not for expressions for some reason. So, but you can grab the code to find which expressions actually exist. And all right, so you can actually use Clang as a library. So we have this function here, which is load from compiler invocation, which actually uh, you pass them command line and command line for Clang, and it will return you an object with the AST and some other stuff they use it on the compilation. Uh, the AST has this translation unit decal, so if you go to the terminal here, and look to the first node, it's a translation unit decal, and everything below it comes from there, so you can uh, interact from there. And the another thing that we ha they have is the, sorry, another thing they have is the types and the qual types. The types are the types itself, so if you define a struct, it will be a type. And the qual type is basically some, this it's type with some modifier like const or anything else. And the cool thing about it is that you can reach to the declaration that uh, generated it, so uh, you, can, you can see where we are going with this. Uh, it also has some interface to interact with the source code, so the text thing of things, and also a virtual file system, so if you want to modify 
like a file, but not actually modify on disk, but in memory, you can do that as well. Uh, but uh, as I said there, uh, I show with a dump of the, A the AST, but we also have a record of preprocessing things, so a history of macro expansions. So we can, we can use that to also embed the, the, what, what, what the preprocessor did uh, when printing the functions. Uh, so uh, this, this class here doesn't, isn't, it isn't generated by default, so you have to pass this extra uh, flag here, which is uh, really, it was really hard to find this, 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 this flag here. So if you are trying to do, get stuff from the processing record and everything was uh, coming new, then probably you forgot to pass this thing. Uh, well, um, well, and it has a rewriter class which allows you to uh, actually rewrite pieces of the code. And Clang also provides you a recursive AST visitor to uh, facilitate things to traversing the AST. Uh, so you don't have to like recurs do many recursive things. So I have some examples here. Uh, that I will show you. All right, so uh, we have this code here, which we'll use as input, as example. But uh, let me open this thing. Uh, well, here we include some stuff from Clang. Um, it's, this is the main function, and this is where I store some of the command lines, command line thingies that we will pass to uh, Clang itself. So Clang arcs. Uh, there was some boilerplate code here, uh, boilerplate code. And then we create this uh, scenevoc object from the, the, with, with the parameters we want to pass to Clang. Then boilerplate code, boilerplate code. And here you can see that we call the load from the compiler invocation that will create the ST unit for us. Then check if the actually, which was actually created. Then I will print, so this the example will print the function names. And if you go to the function that do that. So what we do is to get the source manager so we can uh, interface with these files to print where some of the, uh, the functions were defined. Then I will iterate on the top level of the tree. This is interesting uh, because it will fail to print one of those functions. Uh, then I, uh, we're iterating on that. I check if it's actually a function. Then I get its presumed location object and then print uh, its location. So if we run that, um, so you can see that it actually show it, there is the main function there. Uh, you can see that it, um, yeah, it's, it's keep it the F function. So yeah, but why we, it, it skip the, the, the F function. So if we go to the ST dump, you can see that, why? So you have the translation unit decal, and those declarations are actually in the top level, right? And the only function that is on the top level is actually this one, which is the main function. Uh, so the F function, it's in somewhere. Okay, so here, it's actually inside the namespace, so you will miss it if you do it that way. So what the Clang, the tutorials says uh, you should do is to uh, use the ST visitor. So basically it's the same code, but now we have the ST visitor that we um, uh, specify here. And what we'll do, it will traverse the tree and this line here will actually triggers when I step into a function declaration and when I step into the function declaration, I will do basically the same thing. But now let me go to the end of the file here. 
So this is a function that actually prints, so they call the, the calls the visitor. So here I instantiate that, and here I will traverse the tree, so I get a translation in decal and pass it to the visitor, and it will uh, print everything. So. All right, so here we got the f, printf function, the f function, so it actually got the function, and uh, the main function, right? So, well, this is for uh, function printing, but you can also do it for looking into variables and other stuff. So basically, you, if you'd go like uh, visit, like type def decal, then you, you will hook into it will be triggered every time you step, step into a def, type def decal, so it's really useful. But if you don't want to do that, like using a visitor, then you can manually uh, recurse on the decal context here, so you check if it's actually a decal context, then you recursively call this function many, many times, and it will eventually find everything, so So same outputs, but not using the the the, the as the visitor. And I, I also I have a, a, an, another example here for variables, but I will skip that one because it's the same thing as the the, the function. But uh, what I sh want to show you is the inter is the macro thing. So if we go here, well, it's the same boilerplate code, but the interesting part is here. Okay, so the interesting part is here. So uh, for interfacing with macros, we go this way. So we get the preprocessor, then the preprocessing record. Then we actually check if we got it, because if you if you don't got it, because it, you you pass the wrong flags to it. So here you can see that we are passing this this flag, so we can get the preprocessing record. And okay. So now I iterate on the preprocessing record, and uh, then the, uh, 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 every element of that is a preprocessing entity. Uh, the preprocessing, preprocessing entity can be three things, so a macro definition, an include, so you can the, the hashtag include thingy, uh, and a macro expansion. So here we are looking into macro definition, and I do this tricky here to get the, 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 the actually version of the macro I want because you can redefine the macros as you wish on C. Uh, then I print the macro. And this function here I wrote that uh, to actually print the macro. It's for illustration purposes because for in, in, in Clang Extract we actually copy uh, what was the input text what the, the, that, that the user wrote and it works very well, and it's a lot simpler than that, but I, I, I did this so you can s uh, see that you can actually iterate on tokens and do other stuff with that. And here, uh, I, there is an information on, the, struc on the, the, the structure to see if the macro was used or not. So you can see where we are going to this. You want to remove everything that we don't use. And if I run this sample, So you can see there is a lot of macros which are actually uh, not used, uh, but uh, Clang actually um, includes them building. Uh, so like we are LLVM, we are Clang, we are GCC 4.2.1 for some reason, and uh, yeah. And let me show this. Here you can see that uh, actually only the zero macro is used. Uh, as you can see that, yeah, it's used here. So you know if the macro was used or not, which is interesting. Right. Uh, I will talk briefly about the Clang uh, the writer. So if you do that, some transformation to the SD. All right, you did it, but the source code wasn't modified, so if you 
uh, well, depending on how you, how, do, how you do things, you will lose that transformation you did. But Clang uh, offers you a writer class that you can pass like, oh, they want to replace this part of the text with another thing. And it's very fast. It works like you can chain many modifications and then commit then to the source code. But uh, of course, no, not of course, but uh, it has a limitation that um, if you try to modify two, two modifications on the same uh, region and the region overlap, then it will output uh, garbage code. So if you, you must you must make sure that the changes not overlap. So well, in Clang Extract, things eventually overlap, but we do some uh, prior, we, we prioritize things to remove uh, the the um, uh, the modifications that are less so have less priority. So uh, we did, we we classify things according to the uh, what's their importance on when we're writing things. So I will talk now about Clang Extract. So what is Clang Extract from the user's perspective? Well, it should work as a compiler, but it doesn't really work as a compiler. Um, but the interface goes like this. So you get your command line interface, uh, command, like Clang plus a lot of stuff, then the file, you just replace Clang with Clang Extract, and then you pass some additional, you pass some additional uh, parameters to it. So we use the macro defining interface that is used on both DCC or and Clang, so we can like switch those things back and forth and not uh, with minor like um, that's facilitate the bugs, the bugging. Uh, yeah. We plan to actually uh, like make it, we, 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 so you could replace the C compiler, so you can run it on your entire project and extract what you need from there, but it's not done yet. Uh, here is a command line example from the kernel, so you have DCC there with a lot of stuff. Then you replace it with Clang Extract and put some, um, Extra parameters there to 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 show what you want to do. Okay, so but what's the general idea of Clang Extract about its work, uh, how it works? So we get the declarations that we actually need and put it on a separate set. Uh, we call the set closure for now on. Uh, and for doing that, we use an basically a, a modified version of the recursive IST visitor to traverse the tree from the function to the um, to whatever it uses, uh, account for the dependencies and put it in on this set. Uh, then we like go traversing the tree from top to bottom. And if this declaration was, is, if the declaration is in this set, then we, uh, throw it to the output, and um, well, on the best case scenario, the declaration is written very, very nicely, and we can basically just copy from the input. But uh, on the worst case, uh, it's well uh, generated by macro, and it, it's very complicated. So you just dump from the use the IST dump, and. Uh, if it works, then it's nice, but if it doesn't work, then I will have to go to Clang and submit a patch to, so it uh, works very good. Uh, yeah. Uh, but printing is not actually that simple because Clang do some uh, clever things. So, for example, uh, as, as, I, as I, I said to you, the declarations are on the ST, but the macros aren't. So you have two set to iterate, and what we do is use the source location as a as a way to order things. So we s it's basically the, the the merge from merge sort. So uh, 
you 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 go printing this stuff, like deciding who comes first, and then print it on the the, the on the order. And there are some also some 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 clever things like if you do a type def of a struct, then on the top level, Clang will break it into two declarations. So the 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 struct declaration, the, the type def declaration. So if you try to print this, it will print like two structs. Uh, and it will break the one definition rule, then it will not compile. So we detect this case to checking if one thing is inside the, no the, the other. Uh, and if we do, then we remove the, 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 the struct definition. And there are also some quirks related to attributes. So in this case here, if you go to source, you get the source range from this declaration, it will just get int x but the attribute will not be output because it's on the right side. So what we do, we expand the source range to also account for this attribute. And if the user uh, requires to keep the include files, then what, what we do is we output the include. Then we skip everything that was generated from that include. So we skip the declarations and the macros. Uh, yeah, it, this works. Uh, we also have, uh, uh, we take account into which files includes what files with an include tree, which should actually be included DAG, but it's a tree, so. Uh, well, so uh, regarding the closure computation, I already said something about that, but I'll do it again. Uh, so we traverse from the, the function that, the symbol that we want to extract. So we reach from the symbol to the every declaration we need. Uh, so we traverse the types, the expression, the variables, the statements, and so on. And okay, so if we actually want to uh, add some include, uh, we are to force uh, adding some include, then we will have to add all declarations that come from this include to the closure because we may uh, get to remove some declarations that uh, before this include, that actually is needed by the include, but not needed by the function closure. So yeah, you can get it to work, but uh, yeah, that's how we do it. So basically what I do, what I do so if you, you, you go to extract f, then it will go at f, then say, okay, so this is a, a uh, this is a pointer, so what this pointer is about, so it's, this type has a, a, a struct AA pointer, so it will differentiate the pointer and get the type as the struct AA. So it will go to the, okay, so where is where's struct AA defined? So we'll go here, uh, add struct AA to the set, then go to each of the fields, and okay, so this is int, so it's, uh, uh, um, uh, it's not a composite uh, type, Okay, so we do, we do nothing, oh, same thing here, okay. So we are done with the struct, we come back to here. We look at each statement. So, okay, so this is an int, so it's, uh, uh, it's not compound state, uh, 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 type. So we are done here. So we go, okay, so this is a function, so we need to go to the function. So I'll go to this, uh, okay, so this function here. All right, so I will go to the, 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 the variable definition here, so the parameter. Uh, it's not a composite type, so we are done here, so we go to the statement. Okay, so there's a call to pow, so we go add pow to the, um, the closure, and we keep doing this, going, doing this until we fill everything. And so this is the code transformation, so Marcos. Yeah. Um, hello. Ooh. So, um, when Juliana started the tool, I think that it was nice to use for kernel too and try to compare the, with the tool that we're currently using. And so for kernel, we, uh, we use uh, some symbol visibility checks to decide whether we need to, to externalize a variable or just use the, not variable, uh, function, sorry or just use it f uh, uh, from VM Linux and stuff. So, and then currently we use uh, three uh, information sources to decide if a symbol should be externalized or 
if we can just just call it directly kind of elf objects so if if you were live patching a, a module we just check the symbols from that module the ip clones uh, which is the result of the optimization passes that uh, gcc does and then the module simverse file which contains all symbols uh, exported by the kernel and by all modules then then uh, here's uh, here's the <clears throat> The decision making about if we need to, to if you can use the symbol directly or if you need to ex externalize it. So from the code on, on the right, uh, we have a static function called func a, right? And then we would like to uh, to extract the function f, right? So then first we check all symbols, uh, and then if func a is is uh, is is present if the symbol is present? So, yeah, um, we can live patch the code. Uh, if func uh, one uh, is optimized, this isra is a uh, is a naming uh, change. So, uh, and then don't we have a broken calling convention? So we need to to copy the symbol altogether. And then if function was in line, yeah, we, we also need to copy it for the closure. And so we can't externalize it. Um, so for for inline functions, we can inline them, right? So then we check the f day, uh, the f dump IPA clones. Uh, so this file contains all relations and all decisions that GCC did, like if the a function was inline or or not. And then it creates a graph with the relations for which function uh, we includes which. Uh, when we need to live patch an inlined function, then we need to live patch its color, and then the tool will just copy the symbol that was inlined. And yeah, if the function was up, uh, it was optimized away, we also include it because we need that for the uh, for the closure. So here is an example uh, for a live patch for the uh, VMW GFX uh, DRM uh, driver. It contains a couple of inlined symbols. So the one that we needed to patch was this VMW GB shader in it. But uh, by looking at the IPA clones uh, dump, uh, it was inlined into two another functions, the VMW user shader alloc and VMW shader alloc const prop, which was uh, optimized and transformed by GCC. So in the end, we needed to live patch uh, two other functions that were present and uh, also hookable uh, for the, the live patching uh, point of view. Which is this VMW shader define uh, Yocto and VMW compat shader add. So, this is just an example to show how things can get uh, more complex than uh, initially thought. Um, yeah, so that's basically the explanation that I did. So, and then in the, uh, in the end, Kalinga ex extract copied these two uh, functions below. Oh, sorry, uh, we extracted these two, but then in the end we had to copy all these three together to only live patch this this one. Sorry, to just fix this function here. Um, so how we do that? Uh, so when a function is in line, we just copy the, the, the body of it entirely. And one the other symbols, they are uh, uh, present, we can just exter externalize it. So what we do that, uh, we just uh, have the same uh, um, calling arguments and return types. And for the, the kernel, we use the KO sims to populate those, those function pointers uh, on module init, because live patch on kernel is just um, a module, right? And, but that will change soon, since now we have IBT on the kernel enabled, and we can't rely on KO sims anymore. So it's not um, explained in the in the in the in the talk, but yeah. So for the kernel side, we just need to to recheck this soon. Um, so this is just an example of that module simverse file. Uh, this was added to the Klingon extract when we added support for for kernel live patching. And so for each symbol that we find uh, on the closure of the function that we are extracting, we check the source of it. So if the symbol uh, is uh, exported from VM Linux, we can just call it because it will be always present, right? But if it's uh, exported by another module, so we need to extern externalize it, uh, as shown here. So we create this kind of function pointer 
We copy the same uh, prototype from the function and we just populate it. Um, as we can see here uh, on the green, the greener, <laughs> we can see that some functions were exported by VM Linux. And this waters here, they were from this configFS uh, module. So yeah, I'll just give back to Giuliano. All right, so uh, Clank Extract works uh, with passes. So what e each of the passes do is generate like C code, and it's fed to the next pass, which then generates another ST, uh, which will do this thingy, then uh, generate another, co uh, another C code that will be uh, compiled into another ST, uh, and so on, and so on, and so on. So uh, here we have the uh, build ST pass, which just generate the first ST. Uh, then we find the aligned symbols using the, the, the uh, IPA clone uh, thingy uh, that Marco said. And that, well, then we use the closure pass to actually discard everything we don't need. Then we find with, uh, look at which functions need to be externalized. Then we go to uh, look into what uh, to actually externalize the functions to so modify these the thingies. So then we act, we again uh, throw everything we don't need away, and so on. Uh, yeah. So after this pass, uh, we have the our output code. And uh, yeah. So we have this uh, variable here to show. Which uh, passes? Uh, which each pass do? So I have an example here with OpenSSL. Uh, let me check. Okay, so all right. So this is part of the OpenSSL code. Let's say I want to uh, extract. Okay, so crypto malloc here. Let's say I want to extract crypto malloc. So it calls a lot of stuff, but uh, here is the GCC line that make kindly give us to give it to us. And as you can see, uh, the input is accepted. So what I do, replace it with Clang extract, then we pass the things we want to pass. So let's extract functions, crypto. And the output. Right, so uh, it is warning to remind me to, to find the, to, to fix the, the, the uh, included the tree thingy. And uh, so as you can see, we, we actually didn't feed a lot of stuff that I said we, we actually use. So we didn't feed the elf. We didn't feed the, the, the uh, IPA clone it. Uh, so because we wanted to get this tool to do the best it can, so to do the best assumption it can, uh, if it doesn't, it doesn't have information. So, and as you can see, so uh, the default uh, mode of this tool is to actually uh, expand everything, and in OpenSSL it works very well but not in kernel. In kernel, they want to keep the includes of, of thingies. And as you can say, as you can see, we have the definition of crypto malloc. And if below that, there is nothing. So this is what Clang Extract found to be the necessary things uh, to compile this, this function from this file. And if you go to the inputs accepted. So it, it has everything it needs to compile uh, by itself, but not, of course, to link by itself. You have to link with uh, oh, lib crypto for that. Uh, th there is also the, the, the CI dump passes. OK, so it crashed. Um, yeah, so I will skip this one. But yeah, happens. And yeah, so some of the bugs that we found on Clang. So this one is about, uh, it's really, really interesting because 
uh, you expect to, if you use Clang as a library, to it actually have the same behaviors as using Clang in command line, but that's not the case. So, for example, okay, so let me open the, the, the other one because that's not the bug that I want to show you right now. Um, yeah, so this one. So what happens is that for some reason uh, the count macro counter it re <laughs> it uh, restarts uh, if you uh, include a new file. So uh, kernel uses that to generate some unique functions to check things, and what happens is it breaks the one definition rule. And well, if someone has an idea how to fix that, I will gladly accept any comments. And uh, there was. The another bug, which is basically a fix uh, many cases where the attribute was dumped incorrectly. So in this case here, we have like we f they define things. Okay, so they actually the, the, the dump the uh, dumped like something like this, which is not accepted by the parser. And um, yeah, so basically that's the main bugs that we found on, 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 on LLVN. There are some other bugs that may exist, but I couldn't uh, like create a reproducer for that. So yeah, so we, 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 we often implement things. Um, yeah, that's it from us. Uh, so here is uh, some references with code. Um, yeah, so anybody have any questions? So I have one question. So when you do a live patch, do you run the Clang extract on the original source that doesn't have the fix and then fix the uh, compilation unit you get from the Clang extract or do you extract the fix itself with Clang extract? Extract the fix itself. Usually okay. it's that. I'm just curious, you had an example of taking the command line of GCC in the kernel on one of the slides, mm -hmm. and you pass it directly to the clang. Does it really mm -hmm. work, or do you have to mangle it? Because from my experience, it doesn't work really well, because there are options which are supported by GCC, but, but not by uh, clang. Yeah. yeah, so what we did, we just dribbled ah. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, but, then, that, but, then that works, yeah. No, yeah, because there are some functions, uh, some options that have different names, right? Different mm -hmm. descriptions. And yeah, for, for now, I just remove them. Yeah. So you have some script which just somehow mangles the command line? Uh, Clang ex uh, in the Clang ex extract, you have a list that of things yeah. that we just compare and just remove those, yeah. So you are not afraid of breaking the things? So this the thing is that, <laughs> no, we, we, we are actually. So the thing is, <laughs> the thing is that currently we use KOP CCP yet, and we are just exp experimenting uh, Clang extract. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> the the these are the the the, uh, the arguments that Clang doesn't understand. But so the thing is that we are currently using KOP CCP to generate them, and I'm just uh, prototyping with Clang extract and finding bugs. But yeah. So I'm using both of them right now, but we rely on KOPCCP now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if you take a look, well, so it's mainly warning. Uh, then it's machine things, so we don't use anything machinery. So because it's like just uh, the output C code, so there is no machinery thing involved. And uh, yeah, more machinery thingy. Yeah, so it, the C code should be compatible. If we only compiled kernel using Slack, uh, Clang. <laughs> you would have not to have it. Yeah, but then the optimizations might be different. What for? <clears throat> because if you use Clang for yes. more questions, next yeah. talk, Cyril will be talking. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you.